cobalt is just a fascinating area. Friends of ours used to come up, and Sean and I used to come up every summer for a week or two weeks or a month and hunt for silver just playing around. Down south, I've always liked this area, really liked it. Sean and I were actually working in Ottawa for the RCMP at the headquarters, microfilming criminal records, and we decided just suddenly that first thing in the spring we were going to come up here and find a place and stay for six months. And that was 34 years ago now. So then hunted for silver with the metal detectors and played around and did some prospecting and staked a few claims for silver and looked for a bit of gold. And then um, diamonds come into the play 20 some years ago with uh, when Keith Barron dropped in the area with Rob Towner from Montana and they were looking for diamonds. In the Nipissing Diamond, there's an interesting story about a diamond that was found in sometime around 1903 to 1904. 1903, 1904, right at the start of cobalt. Um, an 800 carat yellow diamond was found. They called the Nipsing Diamond for the name of the area. And it was found either by or by somebody that knew, a father parody. And he had the diamond in his possession long enough, he drew a actual, a really good sketch of it next to an American nickel for size. And father parody was a renowned artist both pen and ink and watercolor. His actually paintings are still collectible. And he was quite a prospector. So he actually had the diamond and then, and well, it was in his possession. It was sold to the MPP back then and Mr. Oben. And Mr. Oben, after verifying from various sources that it was actually a diamond, and it made a number of newspapers of the time period, and it was shipped down to Tiffany's of New York, or actually Oben took it down there. He also showed it in Parliament to the attendance of various MPs and MPPs. So it went to Tiffany's, and when it went to Tiffany's to be cut, they immediately sent up a contingent of geologists and diamond experts to Cobalt, west of the lake, to Miskaming, to look for the source of the diamond in 1906. And that's actually documented. So when I was, uh, first time on Google Earth, I was flying over Cobalt, actually looking for waste piles tailings and I flew over this one spot between Cobalt and Silver Center and here's a perfectly round lake and I thought that's really odd because I knew a little bit about kimberlites that sometimes you're under round lakes. So I had the claim staked by Mike Brett and then waited almost a year because that was in the fall before I finally sampled it. So I sampled it and just gold panned the till sample which is really hard to do for indicators and I was with a little microscope on the table and I started finding these really nice looking garnets. Shiny stones, green and purple and red. And uh, I thought that was really odd. And at that time, fortunately, the mines office has lots of kimberlite samples and lots of kim samples, kimberlite indicator minerals. So I matched theirs up with mine and discovered that they looked exactly the same. So then I got so interested that there was a few more features. And then by then I'd learned more about it, the fault system in the area, which I kind of knew about. Um, I knew there was Kimberlites nearby in Haleybury area in New Liskard, which is good on that same fault system. And then I started taking more claims and more claims and to the point where I had 120 some claims, 40 acre claims, and just managing by myself, which is, and the family. The family helps a lot. And so anyway, then it kind of grew and grew and I just kept doing it as a hobby full time. First thing you do is take till samples, concentrate them down to um, a very small volume, like a quarter of a cup or less of, or a teaspoon of uh, concentrates. The thing is they're in the, the size range you're looking for when you're doing diamonds is 0.25 millimeter to 0.5 millimeter. Normally that's the only size you look for. So when you're trying to pan these things down, um, again, if you know anything about plaster mining, trying to pan flower gold, especially out of black sands, magnetite, is virtually impossible. That's why they have different spiral wheels and concentrators and jig tables and whiffly tables to try to do it. And it's the Gold has a specific gravity of 1920, so it's five to 10 times heavier than most other till. In this case, diamond indicator minerals, kimberlite indicator minerals are only a fraction heavier. And they're in the 0.25 to 0.5 millimeter range, which is sort of flower gold. So normal methods like panning just won't work on these things. And then 
you have to learn, in normal panning, you just scoop the rocks off, shake the big things off and pan down because gold is so heavy you can save it. But in this case, you actually have to multiply screen your samples down to get to the 0.25 to 0.5, 0.5 to 1 and 1 to 2 millimeter range, which is extremely tiny, and then try to figure out a way to concentrate that from the background minerals. So that in itself is a extreme challenge and it's better if you have a lot of background in plaster mining and concentrating stuff like that. So um, the other thing is when I first started doing that, that's exactly what I did below parity. I just took a till sample, rocks and all, threw it in the pan, scooped the bigger rocks out, panned it out and actually ended up saving some indicator minerals. The, again, the really nice looking ones, the purple and red and orange grains and compared with the, what they had at the mines office and they looked the same so I just kept going. And the further I went the more I um, perfected methods of trying to save these. I tried the spiral wheel, the Mansker jig, um, which is a specialized piece of equipment. I had um, small sluices, I, like you name it, and I've tried it and played with it. And then come up with something called a gold cube that just works incredibly. It's a fairly new invention, made down in the States, looks like stacked paint trays, and it's got um, conveyor belt building inside and it forms little eddies that actually save these indicator minerals amazingly and I've actually ran as much as three times through checking as to the, how much it saves and it saves probably 90-95% of the indicator minerals at that size in the first pass and that makes a really super concentrate that is in the proper size range and from then you use various magnets now here's the thing Typically, kimberlitic uh, pipes have a lot of magnetite in them. So in the till, magnetite is everywhere. So you have to use various size magnets, some of them big and some of them powerful. In labs, they use variable belt-driven or drum magnets and stuff like that to do that. So if you just buy big neodymium magnets, you can actually use them to separate the black sands. And crustal garnets, a lot of the garnets look the same and are almost identical except they're from the surface instead of from the mantle, 120 or more kilometers down. So they have different um, amounts of iron in them. So you can actually use different strengths of magnets to pick off almost all the crustal garnets. And from there you just go by pretty because because they're formed so far down, the kimberlite indicator minerals, garnets, and chrome dioxides, um, mostly the, those two, are gorgeous red and purple and green and blue, uh, like all different colors, but they're really beautiful. And then what you have to do afterwards is get them analyzed at a lab. And that's when it starts costing money because then you don't know for sure whether they're actually kimberlite indicators or not. And um, because it costs about $15 a grain to get tested. And so that can run into costs. So you get a certain amount of that done, and if you're finding them, then you know you're in the area. But just even if you start finding beautiful purple garnets, they're extremely rare worldwide. So if you find them, you can pretty much guarantee they're kimberlitic from a kimberlite. Yeah, the other thing you need is a really, really good microscope, stereo microscope. If you don't have one of them, there's no way you can look through uh, and pick up these grains because they're only 0.25 millimeters. So you have to get yourself a very expensive, preferably used, stereo microscope, really good tweezers. Uh, it requires about eight or more hours a day for several days to pick out sometimes just one sample to get the indicator minerals out. I spend a lot more than that some days to do that. So you have to have a real passion, lots of time, do tons of research or just to find out what you're looking at. Then you start doing other research. You look for fault systems, which we're on. And the nice thing is we're in an area where there's already kimberlites, and kimberlites tend to go in groups from five to 20 or more, so in, within a 10 or so kilometer range. So we've got kimberlites just oh, a dozen or more just north of us in this grid by about 10 kilometers, and some to the east, or west, I mean. And so we're in the right area, and we're also on fault zones. The rift. The, the Tmiskaming Rift Valley goes through there, which is perfect for finding um, kimberlites because they go through zones of weakness. So you look for faults, major faults, which we have, the Cross Lake Fault, the Lake Tmiskaming Fault, and Cross Faults, which are small or localized ones. And where they meet, you get zones of weakness, and kimberlites just love coming up them. So that's really good. Then you start looking for features as in round locked grass, where a lot of the kimberlites, most of them in fact, form under lakes quite often round lakes. So if you get that, then you know that's another good sign. And the size of the grains. 
is really important because most companies only look for 0.25 to 0.5 but having did some research and some math um, you can actually use a formula of four thirds pi r cubed that states that if you find a 0.25 millimeter grain and find a 2.5 millimeter grain it takes a thousand 0.25 millimeter grains to make one 2.5 millimeter grain. And they break really easily in glaciation, which means it floods down ice a little bit further. So you might be finding lots and lots of indicator minerals, but you're a little bit further away and it doesn't necessarily mean you're close to a pipe. If you start finding big grains in the two to three millimeter range, especially fractured ones that are still intact, then you're basically right on top of a pipe. And if you find grains, which I have been with pieces of kimberlite attached, just little green chunks of stuff attached to them, then that means you're extremely close. And there's other features, frosted appearance on the outside. There's something called an orange peel texture, which is kelephyte, uh, kelephyte rims actually I call it. And some other features like that, then you know again, you're very probably kimberlitic, like that's classic. So when you put all that together and you start finding those things and you know you're really close. And as Hassel, the one book here, by a, a really good author on looking for minerals and diamond indicators. If you find one to 10 indicator mineral, you're getting close. If you find 100 indicator minerals, you're right on top of a pipe. So when you start finding thousands in a sample and these other features, NG10s, then you know you're, it's really close. And the other nice thing is we're, for a lot of our targets, we're on top of a great big hill, great big elongated hill. Um, compared to the pipes down the Liskard area. So if you do the um, directions glaciation by plotting, which I did, over 100 glacial striae, the ice actually flowed around the hill. So that we definitely couldn't have gotten the indicators from two things, the distance away, the fact we're 30 to 60 meters higher, so they would have had to travel uphill, and the glaciation actually spread around our hill from all the known kimberlites. So that basically means, in probability, that we have new pipes or there has to be some very close. It all goes together to prove we're right basically on top in all probability of multiple or at least one or more kimberlite pipes. When you find something like that, that's when you have to start bringing in, um, looking at geophysics and bringing in uh, MEG flyovers, EM, we're looking at gravity. And basically the way you go from there is to find a meg low preferably and drill it. Yeah, here's the other thing that should be brought into it is how hard a kimberlite is to identify. They're extremely hard to identify. So even if you do find, if you, when you drill, you drill into a rock that basically is a conglomeration of all the other rocks when the kimberlite comes up. So you get country rock mixed in, you get till mixed in, you get vegetation mixed in, even fossils and um, grains of, of um, pyrite and just about everything else mixed and therefore it's very hard to identify and the only way to identify a kimberlite in reality is when non-similar, non-compatible minerals are mixed together in one rock and you have to kind of find that. So even after you've drilled you can get this core, look at it and a lot of it looks just like every other type of rock. So until you get the kimberlite tested by a specialized lab, you're not sure you have kimberlite or not. One of the things that I get asked frequently is um, with Nipissing Diamond is could it have been glaciated from far distance? And theoretically anything's possible, but the point is if you start reading books like Float Plast or Gold and Other Heavy Minerals, and uh, I've got another one, Drift Prospecting, and a number of others, clear back to Faribault wrote, wrote a book in 1910 for Nova Scotia tracing float. Um, most float is within 100 yards, 100 feet or less. The One of the interesting things about where we're sampling, especially over near Helen Shoot, Shoot Lake and Ice Chisel, it's theoretically possible that the direction of glaciation came from cobalt to our claims. And with all the hundreds of millions of ounces of silver that were found in that area and cobalt, um, none of the OGS reports were the multiple ones where they've sampled all over the area looking for heavy minerals for um, metal deposits, base metal deposits, and for kimberlite indicators, major studies. Um, they've mentioned finding gold grains, indicator minerals, other heavy minerals, and nobody has once mentioned finding silver or cobalt ever. And in our whole sampling program, right below cobalt, right 
close by Cobalt. Uh, Cobalt is actually halfway between us and our, my claims and where the Kimberlites are found in the Lisker and Haleybury area. And in all the samples that I've taken and all the equipment I use, with silver being way heavier than the indicator minerals, um, nobody has ever mentioned finding silver, and I'm not finding any except for maybe three grains in the whole time I've been doing in the 0.5 millimeter range, maybe three of them. The interesting point is we're finding lots and lots of gold grains and they're not accounted for. In Ice Chisel Lake alone, um, I found 20 some gold grains. We did send one sample away to ODM and they found I think it was 34 gold grains in the sample and we're finding regular gold grains but no silver grains. So if the indicator minerals and such are transported a long distance, then we would be finding all kinds of silver because it's only 10 kilometers away to cobalt. But we're not finding that. So the indicator minerals, were, that's one of the things that can be brought up is we're finding lots and lots of indicators, many, many. And some cases more than almost anything found in the New Liskert area. The only case being the seed and Petty pipe, or I can't recall exactly in the report, where they found the number of indicators I'm finding sometimes, but it was right within several yards of the pipe that was coming right to surface. And if you read any of the float plaster gold and other heavy minerals, things aren't transported very far. The one study they did in the Col in Kirkland Lake area, they counted gold grains 100 meters, 200 meters, 500 meters, and a kilometer or two away in a big study. And in that distance, they'd find from one to five gold grains. And after one or two kilometers, they petered right out where they didn't find any. So the odds are of something like Nipsing Diamond or the indicator minerals I'm finding being transported more than hundreds of meters is um, vanishingly remote possibility. Well, there's been profitable diamond mines. There's been, depending upon the literature you read, between 50 and 60 of them. Ignoring placer mines as in India. So you've only found 50 or 60 in the whole world. And the odds, again, are, are it's pretty spectacularly low. But the nice thing in Canada, compared to other countries that I've read, and other countries, but one in every 200 Kimberlite pipes do you find? Because there's lots of pipes that aren't diaminiferous. The number, I think, is something around 4,000 in the world. And so in, generally in the world, about one in every 200 pipes is diaminiferous. In Canada so far, it's actually been about one in 20. So roughly. So that means in Canada, just for whatever reason, the odds are way higher of finding a diaminiferous pipe. And as in some of the richest pipes in the world, especially for their size, are in Latch Grass and Ottawapiskat. And they're finding other ones in Saskatchewan. And our area, actually at one time back a couple decades ago, was the Kirkland Lake area and Cobalt was the hottest diamond play in the world. But the technology back then was not very good and they used what they called the African model which used strictly G10s that had to have a certain number of them and other things, but that's not working in Canada because in Kimberley pipes in Africa and Russia and other areas, um, about, I think it's about 80% of the important garnets are G10s. In Lac de Grasse, um, the numbers, I'm not quoting exactly, is something like 17%. And in the pipe they found in Saskatchewan, totally different type of pipe, there are no G10s whatsoever. So back when they were looking in our area, several decades ago, if it didn't have the right uh, African model of garnets and other stuff, they quit looking at the pipe. And as the former field geologist for Kirkland Lake, who was very knowledgeable, he was involved in all the diamond exploration in this area, he said basically there's not been, there's been almost no pipes in the whole area that's ever been drilled or properly drilled. A lot of them have never been drilled. They just looked at it, not enough G10s, De Beers wasn't interested, so they walked away from them. So you have to start looking at different models and different combinations of garnets and different classifications. And uh, chromites, because they are a certain composition indicates you're, they came from the diamond um, preservation zone, or sorry, the diamond formation zone. And uh, so yeah, so basically what you're looking for is something that is extremely rare to begin with and you have to prove there's diamonds in it. So it all takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and but then the profitability is basically right through the roof compared to any other mine. The nice thing about it, if you get a, a gold mine, you've got arsenic, you've got other contaminations, you've got possibly mercury, where with uh, kimberlite, it's rock. In fact, it, plants love to grow in it.
So basically when you dump it, there's no pollutants, which is really nice and it's perfectly safe. And you can actually, to start up an average diamond mine, especially up in the Arctic, is costs in the billion plus just to get the infrastructure there. And if you start a diamond mine up, an average one that's profitable, you can pay that back within a year to three years, which is just crazy. And from then on, it's just profit. The nice thing about where we are, we're sitting actually right near a former mining town that's known around the world, Cobalt. So the infrastructure is still is all there. We're a stone's throw from the Trans-Canada Highway. We've got railway tracks. Um, there's three hydro power plants in the area. There's gas lines, there's a wind farm, all the rest that makes the end roads within a kilometer less of all our targets. So that means the costs are like way down from anywhere else, which is again, very important. Easy to sample, you can drive there, drive right back out, and that makes it a lot more interesting. So with all the uh, positive indicator minerals we're getting, the interesting um, rocks that we're finding that possibly are kimberlite, we're investigating that now at various labs across the country, um, and continuing to find good indicator minerals. We're still testing various targets. And the fact that, uh, which they'd given up on the area for quite a while now, De Beers is back poking around in the area and doing flyovers, that's well documented. Serious look into this area because, um, as I read in the Northern Miner, they're trying to get out of Africa and they're looking at Canada again now, and particularly the area around Cobalt which uh, is interesting. So we're basically going to keep drilling. Um, and as a result of the results we're getting now, we're staking quite a few more claims. We've been doing that in the last few weeks. We've probably doubled the number that we have and con continuing up the Rift Valley corridor on the major faults, looking for similar targets that I uh, picked out in the past. And we're staking them all up and we're going to be sampling them within the next year. And hopefully we'll continue getting those kind of results. And Again, if we do find anything really good, it's good for the area, good for Cobalt, good for the investors, and we're working hard at trying to get to that point.